morning, family. Good morning, church. So glad to be part of God's kingdom. I cannot wait to see you all. Bye. Welcome to Sunday Church Service. May I have some coffee, please? As you can see, we have our welcome table set up to all of you to enjoy, but no one's here to, to enjoy it with us. We look forward to seeing you guys again when we're all able to be together again. We miss you. We cannot wait for that day to happen. So welcome to the service from the big thing. We miss you. Bye. Bye. so happy to be with you all this morning. Just wanting to say that I love and miss you guys so, so much. And I can't wait for the day where I get to hug you all and worship together and just fellowship again. That's going to be an amazing day. But you know what? Today is also a great day and I'm hoping that you enjoy service. Bye. Buenos días. Somos la familia Ibero Chavez. Yo soy Welcome from the Messina family. Hey. Everybody, I hope everybody's healthy. We just want to welcome everybody to church today from Mercer, from Shore Point, from Central, and hopefully everybody's doing well. We love you all and miss you all. See you soon. Bye. Yeah. Bye. and I hope you enjoy. Hey, I'm Shane. I'm Lydia. I'm Angie. I'm Mike. You guys making a video? Hey, I'll come to you. Yo, how many is coming? We're the Hughes family. Welcome to service. Hey. hey. Good morning, humans. This is Charles Clem IV, also known as the Savage. Get your bread and juice ready because it is Sunday communion time. I miss you all. And I can't wait until we see each other again. Wakanda forever. Good morning, church. I hope you're all well this morning and ready to take this communion together here this morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, be reading from John chapter 1 this morning. Um, I want to talk about the idea that God knows you. Now, you might be saying, well, uh, Johnny, well, of course God knows us. He's God. But I, I mean, God knows you, knows you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strengths. He knows how you're feeling about yourself. He knows how you're feeling about those around you. I mean, God really, really knows you. He's seen you at your absolute worst, and he's seen you at your best. God really does know you. You know, I think we all have this desire to be known and oftentimes get frustrated when we feel like we're not known. When we feel like maybe people or friends don't really know us and we get frustrated about that idea. We get frustrated about being misunderstood. But one thing that we could really rest assured is that God knows exactly who we are. And I want to talk about the implications of that fact this morning. But I'm going to start off reading in John chapter 1 and verse 43. The Bible says, The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. Now, let's stop there for a second. You know, I just watched uh, one of the episodes from the series, The Chosen, and uh, it was the, the one where he you know, calls Peter. And um, as I was watching, I just started to think, boy, you know, Jesus really did choose a cast of characters. I mean, he, he really, really did. And he, and he not only chose them to follow him, but th this cast of characters he chose, he chose them with the intent that they would then go and change the world. 
And it's pretty amazing to consider that because what I find really encouraging about that fact is, is that he knew exactly who he was calling. He knew exactly what they were like. He knew what their strengths were. He knew what their weaknesses were. He knew exactly who he was calling. And yet he still chose them to change the world. The truth is he wasn't looking at what everyone else was looking at. He wasn't going according to preconceived notions or perceptions. Jesus knew the real person. He knew each person intimately. He knew each person that he chose to follow him. And he knows each one of us in the same way. See, Jesus saw people as they were, but also in who they would become. So Jesus was not limited in his vision for them based off of their limitations. He saw them in light of who they would become with him in their life. And Philip, you know, he answers, you see in this story here, Philip answers the call and then he goes and shares with Nathaniel. And, you know, Nathaniel, you know, he responds in a way that at the very least is pretty arrogant. He says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? You know, he, he judged Jesus according to where he was from. You know, as I said, that's at the very least arrogant, the very least. But it's so like even the world, how we preconceive or have preconceived notions about people and prejudge people. He made a judgment solely based off of where Jesus was from. He decided and he concluded that, you know, how impressive could he be? How could he be? I mean, what good can come from Nazareth? See, that's the way the world thinks. That's the way the world operates. It's certainly not the way Jesus operates. It says, and uh, we keep reading, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Jesus knew exactly who was approaching him. I'm sure Jesus knew that this Nathaniel was wondering what good could even come from Nazareth. I'm sure that Jesus knew this guy thinks he knows it all. This guy is at the very least arrogant. This guy's made a judgment without even knowing me. He knew all of that. And yet his response to, to, to him as he approaches is he immediately acknowledges something about his character that, that sounds pretty impressive. I mean, Jesus says of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. You know, if we know that someone is prejudging us, it's pretty difficult to have a positive thought or even say a positive word about them. Jesus knew who he was and still held him up. He didn't highlight at that moment, he didn't highlight all that was wrong with him. He highlighted something that was right with him, which is amazing about how God is. And you know, what's amazing is that as soon as he says this, Nathaniel says, well, how do you know me? You know, he's, he's probably computing his head. Well, I've never seen him. How does he even know me? And then Jesus tells him, hey, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And, you know, a lot of theologians kind of go through trying to figure out, okay, well, why would that have stood out? Some say, well, perhaps it was he, he never actually physically saw him. So, so Nathaniel realized, wait a second, he never physically saw me under the fig tree. How did he know I was under the fig tree? Or maybe he knew that what he was thinking about while he was under the fig tree. We don't really know that part, but clearly Nathaniel was impacted and so much so that he immediately acknowledges Jesus. He says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. I mean, that, that was a pretty quick turnaround. We see here that Jesus knew Nathaniel and it completely changed Nathaniel's life. You know, uh, 
John is the only one that refers to this name Nathaniel. In the other Gospels, most theologians agree that uh, Nathaniel is actually Bartholomew. And that's how he's listed in the other in the other Gospels. And so, you know, here is this interaction. And we could look at this one and we could look at how he called all the, the, the other disciples. You know, he could have, you know, chosen people that were perhaps more respected. He could have chosen people that were far more influential. But yet he chose who he chose. He knew who he was choosing. And he decided that he was going to change the world to these people. You know, God has a habit of going against the grain in terms of how he views people and then who he chooses. He goes against the grain. You know, I was reading about this idea in, in uh, a book called Encounters with Jesus. And Timothy Keller writes this. I want to read this to you. He says, the book of Genesis is a window into what cultures were like before the revelation of the Bible. One thing we see early on is the widespread practice of the eldest son inheriting all the wealth, which is how they ensured the family kept its status and place in society. So the second or third son got nothing or very little. Yet all through the Bible, when God chooses someone to work through, he chooses the younger sibling. He chooses Abel over Cain. He chooses Isaac over Ishmael. He chooses Jacob over Esau. He chooses David over all 11 of his older brothers. Time after time, he chooses not the oldest, not the one the world expects and rewards, never the one from Jerusalem, as it were, but always the one from Nazareth. Another ancient cultural tradition revealed in Genesis is that in those societies, women who had lots of children were extolled as heroic. If you had many children, that meant economic success. It meant military success. And of course, it meant the odds of carrying on the family name were secure. So women who could not have children were shamed and stigmatized. Yet throughout the Bible, when God shows us how he works through a woman, he chooses the ones who cannot have children and opens their wombs. These are despised women, but God chooses them over ones who are loved and blessed in the eyes of the world. He chooses Sarah, Abraham's wife, Rebecca, Isaac's wife, Samuel's mother, Hannah, and John's mother, Elizabeth. God always works through the men or the boys nobody wanted, through the women or girls nobody wanted. See, God does something amazing. And this, I, I want us to really understand this and what this means for us. God chooses those that oftentimes are rejected. Oftentimes may not even be the most talented ones. And maybe right now you're thinking, man, this isn't that encouraging. No, it is encouraging because God knows you and all your flaws. He may know what other people have said negative, negatively about you. He knows the mistakes and the falls you've had. And yet he says, this is my child that I'm going to use to change the world. That is who God is. See, God knows you. God loves you. And God wants to change the world through you. You know, in these challenging quarantine times. We've been stretched in ways uh, that has had us questioning like what in the world is going on? I've talked to so many of you uh, just who've had challenges. Well, how, I mean, how do we work from home and, you know, the different stressors around us, you know, some of the parents, well, how am I supposed to work? But then I also have to, you know, help my kids with school. And then I, I've got to be a teacher, but then I also have to be an IT tech to figure this out. And then we've got to do this. And then I've still got to do my job. Those of you who are working from home, you know, there's a lot of challenges. And I, I've talked to many of you who felt like, man, I, I'm overwhelmed. Yeah, I'm not good at this stuff. You know, I, I was even talking, you know, to Paris and Kyle, you know, personally, it is challenging, you know, to preach at a camera with nobody else there. 
It really is challenging. You know, we're, we're used to talking to people and interacting with people. It is challenging to, to, to talk with any kind of conviction and speak when, when we're talking to just a camera. We've got to really imagine someone else be there. We're all being challenged in ways that, that we, we, has us sometimes questioning ourselves. And man, am I, am I good at this? Am I doing okay? What am I doing? What's going on? You know, and sometimes uh, for some of us, we've got to give ourselves a little bit more grace. God gives us grace. Sometimes I think we've got to give ourselves a little bit more grace. None of us had a playbook for how to handle these times right now. None of us had, oh, well, this is, this is what it is, what you do during the quarantine. Here's how you do your job. Here's how you do No, what? You know, we're, we're figuring things out as we go. God sees it all. He knows what's going on. He knows. He sees what we're going through. But yet at the same time, he gives us grace. And he says, look, I know you stumbling through this time, but I still want to use you. You know, for some of us, the issue is not giving ourselves some more grace. For some of us, it's we've got to decide, i got to stop complaining about the circumstances, and figure out how God can use me during this time. Who can I encourage? Who could I call? You know, one of the most encouraging things that I've seen disciples do, and some have driven you, when you drive by someone's house and just wave at them and let them know, hey, we're here, and you get to see a face, it's encouraging to see that. So encouraged. It's such a small thing, but it's so, especially right now where we can't really see each other, it's so encouraging to even be able to see each other from a distance. You know, it's been so encouraging being on these uh, devotionals and the, the different meetings that we have online and we've been able to see each other's faces and, and share with one another. It's been encouraging that we, we can't underestimate how much God can do even through this time. Yeah, he knows you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows if if you've been complaining. You know, it, it just came into my mind. He knows if you've been bad or good. The Santa Claus, forget that. But he knows you. And yet he says, I know you, but I love you. And see, I'm trying to change you so that you could help change the world. And so I want to encourage you this morning. I don't know what kind of week you've had, or even if, you know, how, what kind of time, you know, the, the last 60 some odd days we've been in quarantine. I don't know what that time has been like in general for you. But I want to encourage you with this. God knows you. God loves you. And God wants to change the world through you. Don't underestimate what God can do through you. Don't think of yourself too lowly, not thinking of yourself in an arrogant way, but don't think of yourself in a lowly way where you miss out on the fact that God can use you to change the world. Yeah, we're all messed up. God knows that. Yeah, we make tons of mistakes. Yeah, God knows that too. But yet God still wants to change the world for you. I pray as we take the communion this morning, that we reflect on that sacrifice because it's because of that connection with God that we can see ourselves doing amazing things for God because it's Him working through us. So as we take the communion this morning, let's take it with sincerity and with gratitude because we've been forgiven of so much. Because it's a reflection, it's a sign of just how much God really does love us. And... Because it allows us access to this connection with God that allows us to make an impact in this world. Let's take communion with that kind of heart and that we could really see God in the way that, that he wants us to truly see him working in our lives. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today, God. We thank you for this time that we're about to uh, have in taking uh, the communion, God. Father, we know we've been forgiven of so much. Father, we're so grateful for the sacrifice of your son, Father, for each and every one of us. Father, we're grateful that you would allow your son to die for us, God. 
Father, we're grateful that you love us. Father, that you know our worst moments, you know our worst mistakes, and yet you love and cherish us, Father. God, we're so grateful for that this morning. God, we're grateful that although we may be limited, although we may have weaknesses, although, Father, we may think we cannot do something, Father, we know through you, you can use us to really change the world. God, I just pray that as we take this communion, that we could reflect on that, that we could really be grateful for the fact that you love us and that, Father, you want to change the world through us. God, we love you. We thank you. We pray all this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. My heart rejoices at the thought of spending all my days with you. My soul is singing as I bring all glory and all praise to you. My heart rejoices at the thought of spending all my days with you. My soul is singing as I bring all glory and all praise to you. Spirit, Holy Spirit, bless 
Blessed Savior, Blessed Savior, all the same, all the same, my heart rejoices at the thought of spending all my days with you, my soul is singing as I bring all glory and all praise to Some. 